Welcome everyone to the maintainer monologues, even though this is a panel. Um, we're going to start with intro. So everyone share what project or I guess what CNCF project you've worked on and what your first open source project you worked on ever was. Yeah. Am I, am I going to start? Okay. Uh, I'm Jason, Jason Hall. Um, I have worked on or related to a number of CNCF projects. Um, I uh, work on Co, which is a sandbox, sandbox project. Um, I've worked on Tecton, which is a CD found, foundation project. OCI, very SIG store, many co-related things. Uh, that's, and my first one, I don't know, I forget and I probably should. Yeah. What yeah. about the first one you remember? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know, a bunch of crap. Go ahead. <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. Hi, I'm Sarah Kristoff. I am the maintainer reporter, and I've contributed to a bunch of other stuff, Istio, Kubernetes, Helm, um, those kind of things. And yeah, I can't remember the first one I contributed. Why did we write this down? Um, <laughs> probably like Istio or something. Does like, does console still count? Does have, it's not, it's like open source-y. Um, it was, so like, yeah, or like Raft or etcd, those types of things. So yeah, I, I would say one of those. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Scott Rigby. Hello, everyone. I um, okay, so I'm a Hell maintainer um, of basically almost all the Helm components, but not Chart Museum, <laughs> except for that one. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm also a community maintainer of Flux. I was brought in to help main, to maintain the, the Flux Helm controller, but then I got pulled off onto a special project, and I'm telling you this because this is the third uh, CNCF project I maintain, is Open GitOps, which the special project I was pulled onto was like basically helping to grow the community around GitOps and helping to make the principle-led, get the principle-led de led definition of GitOps agreed upon by like everybody in the universe and come up with like a 1.0 that like the world agrees upon. And so we did that and uh, the home for that is a project called Open GitOps. So that's the third one that I um, maintain. First project? And, and the first project that I contributed to, mm -hmm. open source project was Drupal. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I still officially, that's so cute. <laughs> Ouch. And I still, <laughs> You're going to love I, my answer, by the way. Really, oh, my God. And I still uh, officially maintain uh, a bunch of modules there. But that's just because, I don't know why, I never took my name off of them. Hi. I'm Ryan Nowak. Uh, I work for Microsoft. I'm a, a maintainer of a sandbox project called Radius. My first open source project, this is a fun one. Uh, my first CNCF one was Dapper. My first open source project was ASP.NET MVC at Microsoft in 2012 which is both the first Microsoft project to ship open source components and the first like significant one to be open source. And so I've been through the whole journey of open source uh, stages of grief at Microsoft at this point. So it's his fault. It, it's, it's our fault that we're contributing so much. Yes, thank you. I'm going to do a quick intro. Um, I'm the moderator. I'm Karen. Um, I also have been working on Helm with Scott. And actually, Helm was the first open source project I worked on. I have been a part of it since the beginning, which was 2015 at the first KubeCon in San Francisco. So yeah. Um, all right, let's jump into our first question. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, project milestones, um, and kind of just like, what is everyone's story of the projects that you're involved with? Um, how'd you get involved? How'd you find your grounding? And like, what milestones do you have worth sharing? I think everyone was going to answer this oh, one. This isn't everyone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> What's the story of What's the project? The yeah. yeah, and like any yeah. milestones, anything that helped you get grounded with your project? Yeah, um, I, the, the biggest open source project I've worked on or contributed to or maintained is, is Tecton. Um, we uh, started that while I was at Google and Red Hat was very involved. It sort of spun out of Knative early days. Um, I think the first sort of, and it's not like an official milestone in a, a CNCF milestone graduation, sense but the first time that someone came to a community meeting that I didn't know from a like from a company or like from like I had heard about this and I wanted to you know see what it was was like 
holy crap, it's escaped the lab. Like, it's not just us. <laughs> it's not just you, you and us three doing this. It's like someone else heard about it and came to learn about it. Um, and there's more milestones after that, but that was certainly like a, oh, it's real. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. For Porter, the it came out of like Azure, like problems that the marketplace was having, and a lot of like really cool people from Deus, old Davis Labs people spun it up, so it's actually really well written. Um, and so I kind of came into taking over it recently, and the last two years been trying to guide it into a uh, incubation. I would say the best project milestone was recently I was able to take a vacation and I felt like it wasn't going to like light itself on fire. And when people asked questions, other people responded and I was so hyped. And also like I took the vacation. I was like, the project's taking care of itself while like checking Slack like and like GitHub. And I was like, is it okay? Um, so I, I was really happy about that. So yeah, that's probably it. Oh my God. Yes. You'll get there one day. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. I hope so. Uh, Mine's still like totally not even funny or cool. It's just it's just uh, the milestones that the Helm project went through. Uh, basically, two of the projects I've been uh, maintaining have gone through the graduation process. And Helm is a little bit different because it used to be part of Kubernetes. Like it was, I don't actually know. Is there anyone in the audience that like knew that or didn't know that? I didn't know that. Yeah, it was a sub project, and it graduated within Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. It was yeah. already a graduated project that got split out into its own project. <laughs> Uh, like one of the first, one of the early CNCF projects, right? Because like CNCF was how, like created to house Kubernetes. And then there were several others. And in any case, like, yeah, so Helm, like, but it, Helm skipped Sandbox because it went right to incubation. That was, it like got demoted from being graduated to incubated. And then fairly, I think, you know, um, and then there was criteria at that point. It's like, how do you actually like, what's, what's CNCF criteria for being able to stand behind saying something graduated? So like, it actually was kind of a lot at that point. It's more, the criteria is higher now. But we went through like pretty major security uh, reviews by a third party security team. Um, did, a lot of, did a lot of stuff uh, and they graduated and that was cool. Yeah. My story is kind of cool. I was over in .NET land doing .NET and as part of that role I was learning all about this cloud native thing and this Kubernetes thing and I said this is pretty cool. Um, the project that would become Dapper was being developed internally at Microsoft at that time and it was called Actions. Um, was the original name of it. And then suddenly our friends over at GitHub released this thing called GitHub Actions and said, well, we need to rename this project. Um, but, but anyway, kind of continuing that, I was collaborating with those folks internally. They needed help from people who knew .NET. And so I was helping them. And eventually I just decided, this is cool. This is the kind of thing I want to be doing and went over there. And then I stayed in that group uh, after Dapper kind of left and uh, started Radius there. We have a little bit of time still, so I'm going to ask how each of you became a maintainer. Nepotism. Oh. No. Uh, uh, it's not not nepotism. Uh, we, we started the project, and uh, uh, we, were, we were, you know, I think the three or four first people to ever do anything on it. Uh, and then when folks started to come and be interested in it, we were like, oh, we should be a real project. Who are the maintainers? Who are the, you know, roles and responsibilities? Um, so... Being there at the ground floor is one way to do it. Um, maybe not for everyone, but <laughs> please don't all create new projects. Go ahead. Go ahead. My story, not funny, but or fun. Uh, <laughs> if it was funny, that would be worse. It's sad. It's very sad. Yeah, my uh, my lead maintainer, she she uh, passed away, and then I was like fuck it, I'm going to run with it. And I've done, been doing that for two years. And it's been pretty cool, uh, mainly because she was such a great note taker. So like literally everything the project needs for the next two years up to like right now was already written down. And I, I just had to do it. Um, and everything is in like some doc somewhere. But I do have times where I'm like, Carolyn, where the hell did you put the release guide? Oh my God. And then you spend two hours and you get to the release guide. And it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And like you're angry about it. So yeah, it's been great so far. And it helped kind of, through the sadness, the community kind of came together. And I am very close with my maintainers because we went through such a trial together. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I just got, I just obsess on things. Pretty much, and I don't know. I think when when some when I think something is like really cool, I don't know. Usually, usually that's what it is. I obsess on something, and then I'm like, 
hey, there's a lot of things wrong with this. <laughs> right? And I'm like, like, oh, God. Uh, and then I learn more about it. I'm like, oh, that's why there's a lot of things wrong with this. It's a lot harder than I thought. Um, but, but then, you know, like I, I start contributing a lot to something. And then um, usually I'm, I'm asked, hey, do you want to like, keep doing this? So that's, I guess that's been the case with the, these, well, two of the CNCF projects anyway. Um, uh, Helm and Flux, which I did not initially, initially write either of them. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just like, I'm like, wow, this is, this is awesome and I want to contribute. And I was doing it and they said, yes, please, please help, please do this and here's some more responsibilities. Uh, and, um, and then in the past with other open, open source projects, I guess I, I guess I started doing open source stuff in, I mean, there are some real OGs in here, but like I started doing open source stuff in 2006. That's a long time ago. It's like a while ago. In tech years, it's like a long time ago, mm -hmm. I guess. But, um, but yeah, uh, it was always the same thing. It was always just like, I think it's really interesting. And then you start like either building stuff or contributing stuff and helping. And someone eventually says, hey, <laughs> can you take some load off me? <laughs> Somebody has and that's, to be in charge. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then eventually you find yourself in charge of something. You're like, oh, God. Uh, now I have to find it. Now I have to like, it's like, the, it's like a, a curse. You know what I mean? Like you have to <laughs> pass on to someone else. It's like you trick them into thinking like, oh, wait, oh, shit. You're Sorry. really selling it. I know. You're really selling it. <laughs> yeah, like that you, you basically trick someone into like taking this golden paw or something. And then you're like, ha ha, and you like jig away like gaily. And that's like how I do it. Yeah, that's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I got it. I became a maintainer on Dapper because they needed people to build .NET support for it. And honestly, they like poached me from my other team at Microsoft and recruited me. And that sounded just fine. Like doing open source sounded cool. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a unique situation because we're a team at Microsoft that like kind of only does open source. We don't really care that much about Azure. I actually spent a ton of time with like AWS and other things. Um, and I was the radius, which is my focus now. I was the like originator of it. It was kind of a conversation between like me and the Azure CTO. And it was like, okay, go create something. And then like a couple of years later, I'm, I'm here and it's in CNCF, which is really cool. Well, cool. all right, let's move on to learning the ecosystem and interacting with it. So how have you all built relationships and collaborated with other projects and maintainers. So working beyond your own project, like competition was one oh. of the things you talked about. Yeah. And um, yeah, and what did we write? Oh, um, working groups, tags, things like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll start, but I'm sure there's, there's more. Um, uh, on the topic of competition specifically, I think there's uh, sort of it's hard not to find another project that does a similar thing what, to what you want to do and consider them competitors and sort of, you know, shake fists at each other from across the convention hall. Um, in reality, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, you're all doing the same thing together, right? You're trying to solve a problem, make something work. I think there's a lot more, uh, a lot more power in the collaboration of that than the, than the competition, right? Like sharing what did you do, what, did, what worked, what didn't. We tried this, never do this. Um, uh, I gave a, a talk at KubeCon a few KubeCons ago uh, with, um, I, as a Tekton maintainer with the Argo workflows maintainer. And, you know, those are ostensibly competitors, right? Like in some, in some uh, world where competitors exist. Uh, and it was a super interesting talk, I thought, because I was like, you know, how did you solve this problem? What did you do to, to you know, there is a tech, both technical problems and community problems and politics problems. Like, what did you... It was like talking to an alternate universe version of myself who made different choices. Um, so definitely, I, you know, if you are worried about competition, don't go talk to them. Learn what they do. Learn what they what they like, what they don't like. That only, I mean, that mainly only works in open source. I think there's. We'll talk more about uh, the business relationship versus open source later. But definitely, like you know, go talk to someone who you think is a competitor and say what works what doesn't you know um share your knowledge learn some learn learn some from them no nda is necessary right yeah, yeah it's all open source you can't yeah. yes yeah always friend da's yeah. friend da's, yeah. friend DAs yeah. always. explain what friend da is it's when you're you're buds so yeah. you don't tell the cops or something it's cool um <laughs> this is recorded this is a recorded the cops don't, don't know have youtube um <laughs> i am in a wacky position where i have oversee two projects that would be competitors, but they have very different user groups. So Zarf, which is uh, what I'm paid to work on, 
has very much like a DOD military type of like, this is our user group and they have different needs than like Porter, which is adopted by like, you know, Microsoft by chance. And, and so like Microsoft needs are very much different than the governments. Um, and I never see them as fighting. They both have like cute little wacky icons, but they both <laughs> satisfy like completely different needs and have different user experiences. And I think that's a really like cool thing to see it that way instead of like, oh, I'm gonna go like these projects are fighting. It's they just have like two different like user experiences and that's what they need. I love how we're like really going in order. You don't have to. Know, we we're totally like know. opt in whenever you want. Can I can I skip Scott? Cut him off. Cut him yeah. off. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, let chaos reign. I want to add on something that Jason said, which is like I find other maintainers of other projects really approachable because they probably have thought about the same problems you have and they're probably like have the same struggles and challenges that you face as well. And so I feel pretty comfortable just like talking shop with other maintainers. I feel like those are always really constructive conversations. What I find way more challenging is when end users and adopters are like, compare your project to this other project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm like, mm. so like my approach to that has been to like write these things down and get them looked at by a bunch of other people and put them on like the website. And I'm just like, if you want that explained to you, it's there. I'm not gonna say something stupid because I the, the, these people are our friends and collaborators. We don't want to talk badly about other projects or misspeak and say something we didn't intend. Totally. Oh my god. All right. Yeah. So I could like dish so much tea right now. Like so trash talk so you hard. You have one minute. This is recorded. yeah. We can, we can, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um. I just want to like uh, second that um, because I've definitely written blog posts, uh, several of them, like doing deep comparison, deep comparisons to between different projects that are within the same uh, area. And um, yeah, I think just, what was the question about competition? Um, yeah, I think- We're uh, collaborating. Yeah, I, I, really think, I really think that like, I personally wanna see more interoperability between CNCF projects. Like that's kind of like, I don't know, it was sort of an early vision of CNCF and once there were like a billion projects, I think that kind of got dropped. But I would really like to see more of that and I think that um, whether someone's a maintainer or not, um, yeah, I kind of hope that some of you want to see that too. So I'd really like to see, that's more like a project level collaboration, but yeah, um, I don't know. There are some like old historic beefs and most of them are buried and there are new people, you know, we're so all here. we're all friends. Yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. We're going to move on to talking about blind spots. Anything that has surprised you since becoming a maintainer or anything you weren't ready for? Yeah. Yeah, so I can kick that off. Uh, a lot of it is like how many different hats you have to wear. So I thought it was very much like if you build it, they will come, you make great tech and everyone claps and you get the awards. That's not it. You have to go evangelize, you have to go, t go talk to corporations and kind of like bribe them to give you feedback and like tell them to come to your community meetings, please, 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 so that you can start to build features that they'll use. Um, it's a lot of like being your own PM, being your own dev ad, and then also like trying to get in that community mindset of like getting community members that want to take over more and more responsibility so you don't have your bus factor on your project and like get burnout, which we'll touch on later. So that was kind of like the amount of work and like what a labor of love it has to be and how passionate you have to be about a project is insane to me. I wanted to chime in with something similar hat analogy, like some good advice I got that I try to practice is like, think about what hat you're wearing and like what role you're in when you have conversations and answer people's questions. So like, I work for an evil corporation. I'm also an open source project maintainer. I'm also a working group co-chair. So there's a bunch of cases where it's like, well, I can't have a bias in the working group towards my own project or my own company. I can't have a bias towards my own company and my open source project and so on. And, and one of the tools is just to be clear about like, what role am I in in this moment and how am I communicating with people? Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, uh, I'm in that same situation uh, with the, within like, you know, the, the GitOps working group or, or now the Open GitOps project because this is kind of a combination of the last the last one, I guess I knew this was gonna happen. So the question I get like almost all the time, not just me, but like anyone else involved in GitOps is like, so what's the difference between Flex and Argo? Which one should I use? And, um, and the answer is actually like really, sometimes it's really simple and sometimes it's really complex, but it's always, it's always like, okay, I'm stepping, like you said, I'm stepping outside of um, being a community maintainer of, of Flux and saying, okay, well here are factually pros and cons um, gotchas 
and things, either things to watch out for and benefits, specific factual benefits of each project and like how you can choose. And, and, and often I find that people actually use, we hear that people actually use both of those projects and in different ways. So I actually just found, okay, so uh, real, uh, what do you have, 10 seconds? To, okay, so like the Department of Defense, for example, this is known, so um, uses Flux to install Argo. <laughs> And I just found out uh, yesterday that there is a, uh, a, a very large bank that uses Argo to install Flux. So I don't know. It's like, you Which got your peanut butter in right? my chocolate. You got your chocolate in my peanut. Which one's right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, so it's all about your use case. Um, and big blind spot. Um, are we going to talk about maintainability too? Or is this the place? You can do that now. Yeah, okay. Big blind spot is... Um, this might be worth another 30 seconds here because it's kind of a big one, is that I was unprepared for, I, I, I thought if you, right, if you build it and they, they will come, right, um, then, then everything will work out okay as long as you have enough contributors, right? It's like you, when, you, when you lack contributors, you're like, wow, this project's kind of like withering, right? Okay, what happens if you have, I don't know, like 500 times more contributors than you have maintainers to review all of that contributed code? That's exactly the situation Helm's in. I mean, even if we're like doing our damnedest to like actually review these pull requests, um, and I'm talking legitimate pull requests, not just like I fixed a period in this like comment or whatever. It's like um, it just em like em emboldens people to make more pull requests, right? And we always have like somewhere between like three two hundred to four hundred pull open pull requests. S three quarters of them are significant and useful, you know? So what do we do? So anyway, that was a giant blind spot for me. And maybe we'll get into the tips of how to solve that later. <laughs> well, yeah, my next question was about like navigating social dynamics. Yeah. So, um, you know, what's been your most favorite and least favorite thing about navigating project social dynamics? You can, can continue I, can I, can I just the conversation. Finish yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, <laughs> basically, yeah. So, so, how do you actually fill that bottleneck, right? So one of the ways, one of the ways that uh, we have is by taking a card from other projects where we add more rungs to the, rungs, right? Yeah, to yes. the contributor ladder, you know? And one of those is creating a new role within the maintainer group called a triage maintainer. Um, I know that uh, GitHub I guess this is a while back now, created a new role within GitHub's like permission system for triaging, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of unrelated, but actually very, very related in, 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 um, in effect. It, it basically like allows someone who has shown that they like to help review pull requests and set up pull requests to triage issues, you know, to track down like, oh, there are 10 issues that relate to this. I'm going to link them all. Or, oh, this issue doesn't actually have any reproducible steps. Or, um, or, oh, this pull request is supposed to solve this other issue, but actually it doesn't, you know. Uh, to actually go through that legwork and take a lot of the time away from, sorry, not away, to give, to grant that time back to maintainers that we would normally have to do all of that legwork. And we're like not always paid to do this. We're trying to squeeze an hour in to, to review pull requests. And we find that we've only done all this legwork to just like frustrate ourselves to like, you know. Uh, anyway, so these people have been great and they're like unsung heroes. Um, and we have a couple of new triage maintainers for the Helm project. And so you actually become a real maintainer. You just have like, you just don't have the full permissions to like just destroy the project if you wanted to. But um, anyway, if you're interested, please look us up and we'll help you get involved. Helm.sh, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> That's it. Oh, it's my turn. I think, I think most favorite for me is always talking to users like hearing about people using something, being successful, being happy, like even if they have feedback or criticism, like if you're a user, it's kind of good to hear about like what sucks because that's valuable and I can use that to do stuff. I think, so that would definitely be a most favorite. I think the least favorite is like the kind of any, any interaction where there's a little bit of like sort of entitlement. Like I know as maintainers, we've all seen the like, is there an update? Any update on issues over and over again? 
And like, I'm guilty of both doing that and it doesn't feel good to have it done to me. Like, like I've got an open pull request on Helm right now and after this talk, I'm gonna go <laughs> ask if there are any updates Awkward. on it. But like, just think about the fact that there's a human on the other end when we're doing this. Like, I I'm way, feel way better emotionally about it if somebody's like, hey, I know that this isn't getting traction. It's really important to me. Is there anything I can do to help? Is way better than, do you have any updates? Sort of, sort of similar to that. I think uh, uh, I'll talk about a favorite thing, but one least favorite thing is uh, when, uh, I like to make things that are simple and focused and work. And so when someone says, hey, I really like your simple focused working thing, I wish it also uh, you know, made smoothies. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, uh, cool, love smoothies, but uh, you know, that's not really what we do here. You might want to contribute to the smoothie project or whatever. I, I really uh, like Co. Thank you. Can you add support for C++? Uh, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, it, it's exactly those kinds of things where like, uh, and, and a lot of it's like a time drain or a mental drain to be like, hey, first of all, thank you for your contribution. Thank you for your, for your idea. I let, I'm, thank you for using Co or whatever. Uh, but like, not really what we do here, you know, like it's, and it's, it's tough. Uh, it's tough to do that in a sensitive, kind way. I think a lot of times, instead of having the emotional energy to do it sensitively and kindly, people just don't respond. And then six months later, they go, hey, is that, I'd like to add smoothies, please. Uh, and I'm definitely guilty of that. Please go look at the co-issues um, and see all the smoothie requests. But, um, you know, that's, that's, I think that's what underlies it is like, I don't have time or energy to explain to you why I don't think this is a good idea. Those are my least favorite types of, uh, of contributions. Not that you shouldn't send them, but like, you know, those are the hardest to navigate. Do you have a positive? God, no. <laughs> um, when somebody, when somebody contributes something that, that, you know, whether it is a, a period in a documentation or like, you know, one tiny, simple, easy thing that does make, you know, everyone's lives better, uh, it feels really gratifying to see when you do a release and GitHub adds the little like, these six people had first time contributors. I'm like, nice work, but you know, like whatever it is, you know, those, those feel great. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I'll kick it off with a positive. I really like when people say that they like it. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, if everyone's like, I hate this all the time. If someone's like, I like this, or you go to a comp and then there's like this like random company and they're like, yeah, we use this for literally everything. And you're like, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, it just works. I'm like, I don't, I don't trust it, but okay. Uh, I love that type of thing. Recently um, on Sarf 2, someone was like, this works. You have fixed this now. Thank you. And I was like, what is, I've never seen that happen before. Like, what does that mean? How was uh, the issue? No, yeah, they were like, on the issue, they were like, you fixed it now. And I was like, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, so I, I really like that. So that's my good, my bad. I, I don't know. I, I have too much like, uh, feelies. So like whenever anyone's mean, I'm like, buddy, you must be having a bad day. <laughs> and so it's hard to like, really like see as long as they're off the road and they're not driving. If they're not driving, I hate everybody. But uh, if, if I meet someone who, who's like using the product and it's like, you know, they're grumpy grooves, then like, I just try to like kill them with kindness. Um, I guess what I would want more or like things that like kind of bum me out is when you have like maintainers or like contributors that are like pretty active for a while and they just dip off the face of the earth. And you're like, I thought we were really vibing. Like I thought we were buds <laughs> and like, you're just gone now. So if you're gonna dip, like at least like let people know, you know? Yeah. All right, we're gonna wrap up with our last question because there's five minutes left. Um, so how have each of you navigated your own open source burnout? I think we're all, kings and queens of burnout up on the stage, which is dope. Um, and I haven't figured out like a great way to navigate it. And we were talking about this and it was like, you know, go pet dogs or like look into the sun. Wait, it's puppy time outside after this, by the way. Oh it yeah, it's six, right so. outside the doors. Yeah. They, were, they knew. Um, bring them in, bring them in. The sad maintainer panel. <laughs> so we're crying. Um, so, you know, I, we were talking about like, you know, go look at the sun, go pep dogs. Like that's how you fix burnout. But really you need to stop 
kind of making yourself like the sole source of truth for your project and be able to give away pieces of your project. And that's how you kind of navigate that burnout. Like you fix the burnout in the project, not within yourself, because you're just gonna keep this like cycle of like burning yourself out and like needing to check Slack while you're in Cabo just to make sure that like no one's having an issue and like that kind of thing. So yeah, I haven't figured out how to do this by the way. I just think it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't think any of us are going to actually say, like, we've fixed it with whatever. I'm sure. but, Scott has yeah. a really good answer. I, I oh, okay. do, actually, I do, I do. Yeah, so, so, um, so I worked a lot. I worked collaboratively for, like, a billion years before this on other things that were not open source projects. It's, like, been kind of a focus of my life is, like, researching the dynamics of collaboration, too. The problems, the potentials, like, all the bad shit, too. But um, in open source... Let's see, what was it? When we were, I was at Weaveworks, uh, uh, Lee Capilli and I made a workflow diagram with a shitload of suggestions uh, about exactly how you avoid this. Especially, um, I don't want to use the term support vampires, but like, you know, people that kind of like, you meet them and they become your friend, it feels, and then all of a sudden you're kind of working for them full time and you're like, <laughs> they're DMing you constantly. And you're like, okay, so basically it's like, that's really not their fault. That's actually the my fault. It's fault. It's the fault. It's our fault. It's about boundaries, right? And so we're t it's like boundary work, you know? So um, the, the, the practical thing, I think, is, are things like making a, making a set of policies on how I, myself, or you, yourself, and your team, your, your maintainer team, uh, communicate with the community. Um, not to be draconian about this, but it's more like if someone DMs me, like I, so I have a fairly firm policy ar around this, and I encourage other people to do this too. And you can put it in a workflow diagram, like I said, I think it's lost in a WeaveWorks folder somewhere, but I hope like, we can find it and I'll share it if we do. So it, it, it's like this if someone DMs asking a question, my first question is, is, is this a sensitive topic? Is this a legitimately sensitive topic that I'm either reached out to because like I'm on a code of conduct, I'm, I'm doing a code of conduct. Um, like violation, like escalation policy, or I'm, I'm on a security team and you're reaching out to me through this channel, or, or just you're, 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 you feel really embarrassed and you don't want to ask a question. Like differentiating those and saying, okay, well, it isn't a legitimately sensitive thing. I'm going to make this easy on you. I could just kick it back to them and be like, ask in a public channel. And that, yeah, I could do that, and that would be fine. But I also, I do will go out of my way and say, oh, like, would you mind if we move this to a public channel and we can keep the conversation alive there? Uh, I'll summarize what you, what you asked. Does that sound okay to you? And if they don't get back to me, then I'm just going to be like, okay, they didn't consent, and so that's on them, right? But usually they'll say, oh, okay, sure, sure. And I'll do that. That's one thing, right? So you're moving things to, like, default to open is the, is the one thing, this first thing. Second is if... Someone asks a question, it's very easy to say, okay, I'm, I can take five minutes here, and I'll like write out a dis uh, description, um, an answer, um, I'll go and do some research, and only to remember that I've done this like eight other times, right, in the same channel. And I might even say that, and I, you've probably see, either done that or seen that. And so the second thing is to be fairly strict about saying, hey, would you do a little bit of legwork, or can we do this legwork together? And before I answer this, let's see if we can find an open issue for this. Is there one? You know? And if there isn't, you know, try to hunt down those former, even if it's kind of a pain in the ass, try to hunt down those former answers. You know? Collate them if you can. If you can't, fine. That means that all hope is lost for the prior art stuff. But then like, make sure that that gets stuck in an open issue and say, hey, I'm I'm going to, even if you like mistakenly write it in Slack, say, hey, I'm going to move this to this issue and I'm going to link it. Are we out of time? Can you wrap it up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah to wrap up. Anyway, those are just a few. Th thank you very much. Those are a few tips and uh, there are more. So just let's talk about it later. Any last thoughts? Any of you want to like add any, yeah, anything in? No. About that, about burnout <laughs> or just in general? Closing uh, thoughts. I not no. I, I really liked Scott's answer. Like I think I think when we as as uh, I think Sarah mentioned earlier, like when we think about avoiding burnout, most of the guidance you'll hear is like go touch grass, go for a run, things like that. And like I I felt like I learned things from Scott's answer. Like I felt like there's are there's some good reminders for some things that I I once knew in there, and some new thinking about just like 
we come up with technical designs and plans for our code, we can come up with a technical design for like how we manage issues, how we interact with the community, how we troubleshoot and support. And, and, and I think that's really good. I think that's, that's useful to me.